Good morning, everyone. I'm Kim Horton. I'm the Chief Economist here at the Regional Australia Institute. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where I'm coming from today, the Nongamal people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and welcome any First Nations people joining in today. I'd also like to thank the Nongamal people for their long-term caring of the country that we occupy and for their, for their continuing interest in sharing how to care for that country with us. Today is our first Regions Rising webinar of the 2021-2022 series, sponsored by NBN Co and Nutrient Ag Solutions. Our aim today is to have a robust discussion about telehealth, its potential to improve health and health services in regional and remote Australia, and the challenges we need to address to get the most out of this technology revolution. I'd like to warmly welcome our three guests today, the Honourable David Gillespie, the Minister for Regional Health, Dr. Jen Beer, Head of Health and Education at NBN Local, and Associate Professor Jill Benson, AM, Medical Director of Spinifex Health Service. You may have seen their bios shared on our social media platforms through the week. Their bios are also available on the Regions Rising website from which you registered. This session is being recorded and we will make it available on our YouTube channel, along with the slides from our presenters. Media is on the line today as well. Also, remember to get vocal on social media using the hashtag Regions Rising, and you can tag us on Twitter at RegionalOSAUS. Before we get into it, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our Regions Rising National Series sponsors, NBN and Nutrient Ag Solutions. Without them, we wouldn't be able to continue delivering these free webinars, as well as the in-person conferences from the national summit we had in March, to the upcoming regional conferences, taking regions rising to every state and territory by the end of 2022. So thank you, NBN and Nutrien, for your continued support and commitment to regional communities. We have an hour today, so let's make the most of it, and we'll have time for Q&A after our guests speak. You can submit your questions at any time through the session using the Q&A function in Zoom. Make sure to write to your organisation where you're from and who you're directing the question to, if anyone. If your question is chosen, my team here will enable your microphone so you can ask it personally. We received some questions in advance and hopefully you'll hear answers to those woven into the discussions today. Australia is on the cusp of a new era, one in which regional Australian towns have the opportunity to grow and thrive like never before. With a highly mobile population, the regional livability of a place plays a big role in influencing a person's decision about where to live. Outlined in the RAI's Livability Toolkit, access to quality health services is one of the top six factors most important to potential movers and local residents. So what's happening in regional Australia to improve access to healthcare for the nine and a half million people who live there? What does it mean to digitise health? And are we ready for what's coming in this space? Our presenters this morning will all speak from experience. We'll explore the perceptions and expectations of community health and some of the challenges in delivering an end-to-end -end digital service effectively. Connectivity is improving rapidly across regional Australia, and in some cases it seems that access is improving more rapidly than comfort, familiarity and capability. Patient confidence is an important component in breaking down the digital divide, and regional Australia has some great examples of creative approaches that bridge between the patient and the digitally connected doctor. But it turns out that doctor confidence is also important. So the digital doctor has familiarity with the circumstances of their rural or remote patient and has confidence in the on-ground support that is needed to follow through that telehealth consultation. Improving the diversity and availability of generalist and specialist health and allied health services in regional Australia is absolutely vital if we are going to see regions grow to their full potential. I'm looking forward to hearing more today about how a clever approach to telehealth can help this goal. Let's start with the national picture from the Minister for Regional Health, Dr. David Gillespie, drawing on his experience as Minister and as a regionally based medical practitioner. Thank you, Minister. Thanks very much, Kim. Just wanna check that everyone can hear me first. That's a big nod. So, well, look, it's my great honour and privilege to be here with you. This is a really important issue. Uh, regions rising is what the National Party is all about. Um, we are 
a party of common sense, practicality, and we have a long history of uh, doing things that the bean counters don't see as immediately economically viable, but we take a long view that infrastructure, whether it's health, roads, ports, railways, airports, uh, and energy systems is what makes regional Australia and economies tick. Health is one of the most important ones. I have a very active and enduring interest in regional Australia, its growth and development. And if regional Australia flourishes, so does Australia, because that's where all the wealth uh, seems to be created, although a lot of it ends up being concentrated in metropolitan Australia. The wealth creation comes from the regions. Now, ever since time began, settlements, whether it's a village, a town, a city, or a mega city, they've been originally formed on basic principles. Either it's close first and foremost to water or to a food source uh, or fertile soil to grow food. Uh, you can shelter from the elements or from competitor humans that uh, are after the same resources. And economies grow out of basic services. And that can be like a river or a port town uh, or a market town or where there's plentiful forestries, fisheries, and uh, you know, red Indians chase the bison across North American continent. Being on a transport route and being connected, it was critical. Now we have a different connectivity. We have digital connectivity is almost just as important as you said, Kim. In fact, you stole a bit of my thunder there in that brilliant introduction. Uh, digital connectivity uh, can make your home an inland port where stuff comes in and stuff goes out. And if you don't have it, you are marooned. You may as well be on a desert island in the digital world. Uh, now, some centres have grown around education, governance centres, but also health centres is what drives economies and is driving part of the choice of where people migrate to. Having come from the North Coast in a town called Port Macquarie, the, we have a lot of, uh, you know, silver grey haired, you know, silver backs and wise heads who do their homework before they retire. And they've noticed that Port Macquarie has got a great health campus, both university, medical school, and a fantastic base hospital. And that's why that area flourished. In the 80s and 90s, it grew as a medical centre and people voted with their feet. Now, in, the, in this setting here, we're more talking about the other post-COVID change. COVID has changed everything, but in 10 weeks of COVID, we did 10 years of telehealth reform. Uh, that means uh, things really exploded as a matter of necessity, both for infection control and preventing spread, and so people could get access to medical services. We've also had an explosion in mental health services delivered by and drug and alcohol services and all sorts of services through Head to Health and all the digital programs, both on smartphones and computers. So post COVID, uh, digital connectivity is the king. And in regional and remote Australia, we have a lot of that delivered via satellite. And I have been doing my homework to check that I'm not talking through my hat. I am in regional Australia on the banks of the Hastings River. Uh, I'm like a pigeon's flight away from two major towns. I'm in the middle of three NBN towers, but by the tyranny, not of distance, but the tyranny of things called hills and big 40 metre trees, which are native to the North Coast, we couldn't get on the NBN. So I've had to resort to a direct uh, well, as part of the NBN in a way, but the uh, NBN wireless towers did not reach my farm. So we have a sat not a satellite link, but we have a microwave link. A lot of people can't have that capability because they can't get to a microwave link. I just lucked out. So look, for all this telehealth to thrive, you nailed it there, uh, Kim. Not only has the doctor got to be comfortable with the technology, the patient has to be comfortable with the technology. Uh, and you can see that this uh, is evident in the figures. Now I checked some of the 
figures about telehealth access. We have funded $3.7 billion of telehealth services. During COVID, there were 300 medical health MBS item numbers. Uh, and of that 3.7 billion, uh, 0.20, 0.20% was accessed in modified Monash seven areas. Yet 76.42% was accessed in metropolitan Australia. And it goes gradually down the more remote you go. Uh, the Sky Muster satellite was such a big upgrade, it's really transformed it. And Sky Muster Plus, with its extra capability, has been very much welcomed. But, uh, and I know education and Wi Fi calling and video calling is unmeted, but when you're doing education and business, and regional service delivery back into metropolitan Australia, those limits can get reached and things do uh, meet it or get throttled down to 256 kilobytes per second. But with Wi-Fi calling and video calling, telehealth should be able to survive. We've seen an explosion of virtual hospitals or hospital in the home, as it used to be called, where a nurse visited you after early discharge. Now, a nurse doesn't even have to visit you. You can be hooked up with your pulse oximetry, your blood pressure, your pulse, and a video stream of you to a health service, which is a great initiative. Mental health consultations uh, can be enabled, but we have to have that digital access. It has to be a trifecta, doctor, patient, and the hardware, and familiarity with the software. Um, we know that COVID is still impacting things. So we have expanded um, access to telehealth under these COVID provisions till the 31st of December, 2021. But the uh, bedrock of it is your general practitioner. And there are two telehealth item numbers, less than six minutes and over six minutes. But if you are in a hotspot, there is a level C consultation available as well. Uh, for a longer consultation. Um, and the take home message that I'd like to, uh, my own personal medical experience, which I might add for listeners, I practiced for 33 years, full on, probably a 2.0 full time equivalent, uh, both in hospital practice in Australia, the UK, Canada, a stint as a med student in New Guinea Highlands, uh, and in the beautiful Hastings Valley, where I still reside as a medical. Uh, specialists in gastroenterology and general hospital medicine. A lot of paediatrics and general practice along the way. Nothing can replace a face-to-face -face consult, but video health is pretty darn close. Uh, but you have to have an enduring and long-term relationship. That continuity of care is critical for good health care. And someone who knows you and has your history already in their um, own mental memory uh, is so much more efficient than starting from scratch with a hot desk doctor who is just the doctor on duty or who starts from scratch. So telehealth is changing the face of health in Australia, uh, even more so in Metro, judging by those figures. Uh, but some of that is because of the, the conversant nature of the population, as well as people who have not only... Uh, Wi-Fi through SkyMuster, but 4G or at minimum 3G uh, connectivity. Mobile phone connectivity is even more uh, important than you know, uh, computer um, connectivity because 4G in a smartphone does that. But a lot of elderly aren't smartphone people. They've still got their Nokia with just like a phone call away. Uh, and we have some senior Australians who are really conversant with it. They're taking it up, but we want everyone. So we need to train our patients, train our doctors, and make sure that there is digital connectivity, phone connectivity at good enough level so that telehealth can shrink the tyranny of distance. Over to you, Kim. Thank you, Minister. That's a great overview. I'm 
fascinated to hear how, uh, well, we knew how quickly the government had moved to bring so many services to, uh, Medi Medibank, Medicare services to telehealth, telehealth or telehealth services to Medicare. Um, but it's great to, to hear how, how much that actually been delivered over the last 12 months. Fascinating about that, that split between Metro and rural, but, uh, but I think you're right, that's probably because the vast majority of patients and doctors are probably based in Metro, so that's probably swamping the figure somewhat. So looking at how that's, how, the, how that's playing out in terms of proportions of services delivered in regions of biotele versus face-to-face, -face, that would be terrific to see how that, that plays out too. But certainly great to hear you um, uh, sort of reinforce that, that uh, you know, it, 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 there, there are at least three legs on this stool. There's the doctor, the patient and, and the technology. So thank you very much for setting up that overview. Yeah, I've um, got four we can talk about in the Q&A. Great, good, good. Well, thank, and thanks very much for staying on for that. Um, so we'll turn next to Jen Beer, a vet surgeon, now Head of Health and Education at NBN Local, about her experiences working with communities to help them get more out of their digital health opportunities. Over to you, Jen. Good morning, my name is Jen Beer and I'm the Head of Health and Education for Regional and Remote at NBN. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and the lands I'm on today, which is the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and extend that to any fellow Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the call today. Um, and also a huge thanks to Liz, um, Kim and the team for the opportunity to participate in today's discussion. So the purpose of my role is to work with key stakeholders across the health and education sectors to understand their priorities and challenges related to connectivity. And for health, this focuses on the MBN network, enabling digital health and virtual care, both now and into the future, in particular for regional and remote Australians. For me personally, this role culminates the three favourite parts of my career. Um, my time in healthcare as a small animal vet surgeon, uh, community-based work in the not-for-profit sector across WA, South Australia and Northern Territory, and product design and innovation. And today I'm going to touch on three areas. So firstly, as Kim said, what I'm hearing from the regions. Secondly, the critical enablers for digital health. And thirdly, what's next? So firstly, what I'm hearing for the regions. With my role, I have the privilege of working with a range of stakeholders, including healthcare providers and clinics from Ballarat to East Arnhem, to researchers, to national groups such as the Consumer Health Forum, ACRAM, the National Rural Health Alliance and NACHO, and also the state and federal government agencies and departments, including the um, Digital Health Agency. And irrespective of who I speak to, a few common themes emerge. Um, and like the Minister mentioned, the first is acknowledging the unprecedented change we've seen over the past 18 months. And it's been said many times, but the rapid uptake of digital health has accelerated the industry into, in a, into a position that it didn't expect to be in for another 10 years. And whilst it's not perfect, it provides an exciting platform to build upon and highlights the fact that connectivity has never been more important. I often also get asked, and as Minister Gillespie mentioned also around the availability of MBN, particularly across regional and remote Australia. And most people are surprised to hear that it is available across the whole country um, via a range of technologies. And we have some of the most remote areas that I'll talk about um, that are able to access broadband internet um, via satellite. I get many questions also around the capability of the network to support digital health solutions, in particular video conferencing. And there are many factors that actually um, contribute to the overall online experience, including the type of plan and connection, age of devices such as routers and modems, the position of the devices in the home or clinic, as well as some of the software and platforms that are used. And we saw many of these factors um, coming into play in a piece of work that we did with the Aboriginal Health, Health Council of WA um, last year, which is the WA affiliate of NACHO, to support a number of clinics who had raised connectivity concerns when delivering telth, um, telehealth services. And although we're very conscious of the challenges that some people have faced um, and are continuing to face, We've seen some great examples where video conferencing is working effectively over satellite, um, such as Simone Dudley from Therapy Connect, shown in the top left, um, who uses her SkyMaster Plus connection uh, to run her telehealth business from her farm. 
and the Lanapoi Health Group um, that supports 20 homeland communities across East Arnhem, where MBN satellites across six of the homelands, and you can see the Yilpra Clinic in the top right-hand corner there, um, are connecting the patient, the nurse, Aboriginal health workers, and, and up to 10 family members on the ground with a GP in Sydney, um, Dr. John Kelly, who you can see in the bottom left-hand corner there. And these connections also allow the staff to stay connected when they're out in the homelands, which not only improves safety, but also allows them to keep in touch with loved ones when they're out on country for a number of days at a time. And I'm also seeing some examples where you've got non-traditional connectivity that's enabling improved access to healthcare. A good example of this is Gawa, a small, very remote Aboriginal um, homeland community, roughly 600 k's from Darwin. And Gawa is home to about 20 adults and 46 children, and is considered one of the most remote communities in Australia. Gawa are using a Wi-Fi connection on the old school building to hold telehealth consults with an Aboriginal nurse practitioner in far north Queensland. The day of installation was a big day for the community. 17 of the community members had health checks completed using the equipment that you can see in the bottom right there. And also the school children were sent down in groups with the teachers so they could all see the telehealth equipment in action. And lastly, as Kim and the Minister alluded to, Beyond connectivity, many of the groups I speak to talk about the need to lift digital literacy and confidence for healthcare providers, clinic staff, patients and their carers, which leads me to the next part of what I wanted to talk about today, which is digital readiness. So digital readiness for me um, includes both the tangibles and the intangibles. And the tangibles are things like the connectivity, the devices, software and platforms and the intangibles relate to more of the confidence, the effort and the willingness required uh, to participate in digital health. And many businesses in particular over the last couple of years are having to digitise and update, um, upgrade their systems and processes to be able to operate efficiently in a digital world. For many practitioners, in particular small clinics, uh, this wasn't an area that they've needed to invest heavily in before. However, with the emergence of electronic patient records, cloud and edge computing, video conferencing, e-prescriptions, and other digital health technology, digital is fast becoming that critical enabler to their business moving forward. And to help provide connectivity support, we use the findings from the work we did with the Aboriginal um, health clinics, as you'll see um, on the map on the left, uh, and work with other health professionals to produce a telehealth connectivity troubleshooting guide. And this guide is, helped, um, is designed to help healthcare providers and where appropriate their remote IT support to troubleshoot some of the um, common connectivity issues that they were having and also in partnership with their retail service providers. And ultimately um, helping build confidence in being able to use the technology for a video consult. The pandemic has meant that more people have had to embrace life online. However, it's important to support those where it may not come naturally um, or where fear may exist around privacy and security. And some important initiatives are showing promise, such as upskilling local digital health champions or improving tech support for clinics. And even before the on the ground support, the journey to enabling digital readiness really begins with the co-design um, with those who will be using the solution and ensuring the right level of support is provided through implementation. So what's next? At the Regions Rising Summit in Canberra earlier this year, Professor Ruth Stewart, the National Rural Health Commissioner, made a really poignant point during her presentation that if she moved further out bush from where she'd lived today, her life expectancy would drop significantly. In fact, as many of you know on the call, those living in very remote areas can expect to live on average 16 years less than those in major cities. And investing in healthcare innovation is one of the keys to bridging this gap in healthcare outcomes. And telehealth is just the beginning. And it's critical that the beneficiaries of this innovation aren't confined to capital cities. And we're seeing some great examples leading the way, such as Adelaide Hills ONG, uh, the health category winner of the Innovate with MBN grants program, who are a women-centred multidisciplinary practice based in Mount Barker in SA. 
Melanie, who you see in the middle on the left there, um, and the team offer specialist obstetrics and gynaecology services and use their grant money to secure a state-of-the-art, digitally capable ultrasound machine to allow real-time scanning to be performed on-site and streamed to specialist sonologists, radiologists, and maternal fetal medicine specialists via the practices um, service. This is helping ensure um, mothers living in rural areas that have high risk pregnancies or those requiring highly technical ultrasounds are no longer having to travel long distances to the city. And given the rate of advancement in tech, we need to be thinking five to 10 years down the track, not just the next two to three years. And what our work to date has highlighted is the need for this to be a whole of industry approach to ensure that regional and remote communities have access to not only the connectivity, but to the devices, platforms, digital tech support and digital training to set them up for success for a digitized future of health. And we're continuously learning and improving. And it's my role to ensure that we keep working with communities and the sector more broadly to make this work and to enable ubiquitous ac um, access to digital health. And this includes in, um, of continued investment in the network. And last year, we announced a three year, four and a half billion dollar investment to increase capability, reach and value of the MBN network for Australia, and in particular in the regions. So together we want to enable innovation and help create equitable access to quality healthcare for all Australians when they need it, irrespective of where they live. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you so much, Jen. It's, 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 I think there's a real underplayed a little bit, I think, the, the sense that NBN has a, has, a, has a sort of twofold focus now. Just the technology is a big part of it and the availability of the technology, but you really do seem, seem to be putting a lot more effort recently into making sure the technology is working for the end users. And I love that sort of user-driven troubleshooting guide. That sounds like a, a very practical resource driven by the experiences that people have had in regions. So thanks very much for sharing that and your expectations of where the technology will take us in future. Hopefully there'll be a few questions for you uh, in the in the Q&A. Um, now, our next presenter is uh, Jill, Jill, uh, Jill Benson. Um, she's gonna draw on her experiences as a provider of health services in many regional places, including remote Western Australia and having to work at both ends of those, uh, of, of, of the call to make sure the service works well. So over to you, Jill, thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming to this. Um, I'd just like to draw your attention to my background, um, which is Janundara, which is the remote Aboriginal community I work in in Western Australia. I'd like to acknowledge the people who live there and who have taught me so much over the years. I'd also like to acknowledge the people on Ghana land, where I am at present in Adelaide, and similarly, their attachment to this land and Hopefully all of us can work together to make this a better place for us all to live. I'm going to share my screen. So I'm going to talk about my experiences from three perspectives. So I've been the medical director of Spinifex Health Service in Janindara uh, for just two years, but I've been going out to that community for 12 years. I also work as a GP in Doctors Health South Australia and also in the Northern Territory. And I've been up to East Arnhem Land to, to work with Doctors Health there as well and do remote telehealth to rural and remote doctors in South Australia in the Northern Territory. I also work as a medical educator for the GP training organization in South Australia called GPEX. And I do volunteer work for an organization called Rocket Ship that brings medical education to doctors who are training as GPs in Fiji and mostly Tonga. So this is Chenjanjara. Chenjanjara is the most, I think, the most remote community in Australia and probably one of the most remote in the world. It's on Spinifex country in the Western Desert and its nearest town is Kalgoorlie which is about 700 kilometers away. The road is very bad and occasionally is completely unusable. We get our food in from South Australia and I've been flying there from South Australia with the Kakarawilara Health Alliance for the last 12 years, bringing health services, GPs, 
specialists and allied health professionals into Chenjunjara. The population is between 150 and 200 and you can see the beautiful Spinifex country. So my original photo that you can see behind me is taken in the wet and it just looked really green, which is most unusual. The Spinifex people are a very old people. The old lady in the center of this picture is the baby in the photo they're holding. It's a very traditional community um, and has stayed more healthy than a lot of other communities because it's so far from a city. And it seems counterintuitive, but people who are a long way, Aboriginal people who are a long way from cities have traditionally been healthier because they're a long way away from a, a lot of the uh, health difficulties that cities bring. But as the city has become more accessible, the health has changed. You can see more about the Spinifex people who are also famous artists. One of our artists has just recently run, won the, the Indigenous Art Awards on an SBS uh, documentary that was made about them. When I set up the Kakara Willara Health Alliance, I set it up as an alliance of the communities in Yalata, Oak Valley and Chinyanjara uh, at the request of the senior members of those three communities to bring healthcare to remote, those remote areas. They see themselves as one mob. They don't recognize that border down the middle that separates South Australia and Western Australia. But with COVID, we've actually had to recognize that border. And I've not been able to get into Chinyanjara for most of the last two years. I've only been able to get in there three times because the border's been closed one way or the other. As I said, the people in Jinjinjara suffer from a higher level of many diseases and health difficulties, as do many people who are Aboriginal, who live in remote areas and who have um, a lower socio socioeconomic status. And these are some of the figures from the Australian Institute in Health and Welfare. And you can see that there's more coronary heart disease, more mental health issues, more um, risk factors like tobacco use, um, sugar, alcohol, um, intimate partner abuse. Uh, most of the difficulties that we see affecting the health of Australians are more difficult in a remote Aboriginal community. So setting up telehealth was essential for all of those reasons. And in the last, 12 months, I just did a 12 months audit. I've done 196 episodes of telehealth. I've, in addition to that, I've had 210 discussions with the remote nurses. I've had a, a lot of, a lot more than that, um, non-client contact, looking at results, looking at discharge summaries, um, changing medication, you know, reviewing all of that. And so I do about two days a week work in this remote Aboriginal community. So how do I do it? I see people by Zoom. There's a remote area nurse present in the clinic or an Aboriginal health worker present with the person in the clinic. I sit here or wherever I happen to be. Um, I have a computer like the one I'm talking to you on now. I have my remote access computer. I have a tablet that I write on and I have my phone that I accept photos from the nurse, for instance, of particular areas of skin that I want to look at. I'll guide the nurse or the Aboriginal health worker through doing physical examinations. We have a video otoscope, we have a retinal scanner, we can do audiometry, we can do spirometry, ultrasound, ECGs, all of those sorts of things. And so they're sent to me either through the remote um, clinic notes or, as I said, through my phone. I've organised joint telehealth consultations with a cardiologist, which are three ways. So I have the remote access, there's the patient and there's the specialist. With cardiologists, renal physicians, endocrinologists, dermatologists, respiratory physicians, and psychiatrists. And then we have a variety of allied health professionals who do it without me. They use my Zoom account to do it. Um, because that's unlimited. 
And so we've, we've actually had incredibly good care. We can't do everything. I can't put in an implant on. I can't do a full neurological examination. I can't feel those subtle changes to an abdomen that you want to feel. Um, there's so many things I can't do. The things I really, really miss, though, are walking around with the people, being outside to do a mental health consultation, which is where I would normally do them, going and doing an environmental scan, as I did when I was last time I was out there, to try and work out what are the housing issues that might affect people's health. I can't do them by Zoom, but I can do them wherever I am. I luckily spent one of the lockdowns on my partner's paddle boat on the Murray, and that certainly entertained all of the people I was seeing in Chinjinjara because I was sitting on the Murray doing my telehealth, um, and it gave them a view of the Murray most of them had never seen. But, you know, there are, there are some pluses. I can, I can do these things. This afternoon I'm flying to Norfolk Island and I'll do um, consulting from there. One of the absolutely important things about doing this has been the use of my health record. And that's also changed a lot of the way I do telehealth. So for all of the people who are at, um, in Chinjinjara, all of the things that I do are uploaded into my health record. This is so important because the reason the Kakara Willara Health Alliance was set up was that the people acknowledged that they're in a mobile population that they're mobile mostly between Tendinjara, Yalata and Oak Valley, but also out into the rest of Western Australia and into the Northern Territory. My health, health record means that it's possible to have a continuity of care across that wide geographical region. And just a few examples I, from my recent clinics, I was um, starting somebody on a new diabetes medication and I thought, oh, I'll just have a look at their my health record and just make sure there's nothing scary in there. And there was a recent diagnosis of pancreatitis from another community that was not in my notes and I hadn't known about. So I changed what diabetes medication I was giving. Also, I was run by another clinic who had just set up my health record and their medical director was looking at it, saw that I'd really recently done an Aboriginal health check on the patient and rang me and said, do you know this person has high grade changes on their recent cervical screening? Um, the results were not on my health record. Um, and I said, why aren't these on my health record? She said, I know, I'm going to put them on there right now. So just a few examples that have really changed my care of the patient and the patient's well-being because of my health record. I also, as I said, work for a doctor's health service where we see doctors and medical students only as patients. And I do telehealth to rural and remote doctors in South Australia and Northern Territory. This is not just mental health. This is physical health as well. We know that doctors are healthier than the rest of the community in all sorts of ways, but also we are less healthy in other ways. We tend more to suffer from burnout. We, we struggle to access care. Those who work in rural and remote areas, if they're the only doctor there, if they're the only GP, or all the GPs are friends of theirs, how do they access healthcare? So we've been doing rural and remote access. We've been doing it with bits and pieces of grants with the telehealth that came in, we thought, great, we can actually do this without relying on insecure grants. But the recent changes to the medical rules have made that more difficult again. Most of these people I've not seen face-to-face. -face. I do go out to some rural areas to do face-to-face -face clinics, but even that has been difficult recently. But certainly the majority of them I haven't seen face-to-face -face. and having and not being able to charge Medicare for people I haven't seen face to face rules that out. In many of the areas, the bandwidth isn't good enough or there's a storm as, and you know you can't do um, video health. You can only do telephone health. And as with my Aboriginal patients, these are not easy consultations. They're nearly always an hour. 
they're at least half an hour, they're long, they're complex. Medicare does not allow us to do any of these things. I personally would like to advocate for there to be the ability for Medicare to grant exemptions for various things, to grant exemptions, for instance, continuously for my remote Aboriginal health, to grant exemptions for the doctors I see. These communities rely on their healthy doctors. And if those doctors can't get good health care, that doesn't just affect them, it affects the communities as well. So to have these, these provisions on accessing Medicare items is making that care really difficult. Another really good thing I'm doing is teaching remotely. So um, I do medical education remotely for my GP training organization and also in Tonga for Rocket Ship Pacific. And that's webinars, mentoring, small groups. We've managed to do observation and supervision of consulting, other assessments, um, mentoring, case-based discussion, random case analysis. We even did the most amazing exams in Tonga and Fiji where we had all of the examiners in Australia, the doctors being examined for their general practice exams in Tonga and Fiji, all of the people who were acting as cases were at Fiji National University. And we did it. It was it was stunning. Um, it was it was very exciting. Not nearly as exciting as actually being in Tonga, I must say. This is one of those things where this is great, but I'd rather be in Tonga. Um, but it's so helpful for our our Pacific neighbours to be able to build their capacity to have good general practice in those com- countries. I'd like to acknowledge that I do not do any of this by myself. I work with the most amazing teams and the people who work in rural and remote areas have a heart for good healthcare under difficult circumstances and we work together. Working, telehealth feels like an isolated thing, but it's not. It's always done as part of a community, the community who support you, around you and cheer you on. And so thank you to all of you who work in rural and remote areas and for the people you cheer on as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jill. And thanks for reminding us about the importance of community because you've talked about the patient community, but you also talked about the doctor community and the need and, and your efforts to try to enrich their own sort of health status as well. And lovely to hear about so many examples of the breadth of use you're putting this technology to, whether it's not just patients, but teaching as well. And for me too, some really interesting insights into what's going on behind the scenes. You know, the the, the value you're drawing from that behind the scenes black box in in my health record and some of the challenges that are going on behind the scenes too in terms of those Medicare restrictions. So really, really great presentation. Thanks very much. Uh, We've got a a lot of different questions covering a lot of different areas. Um, I'd like to start, Michael Reynolds, if you're still there, I might see if I can get one of my team to unmute your microphone because you had a particular question which related not only to what uh, uh, Jen was, uh, Jill was talking about, but also the minister in terms of uh, these uh, MBS telehealth items. Are you there, Michael? Would you like to ask that question? Can you hear me? I can indeed, yes, we all can. My question is to the Minister, just in regard to the MBS telehealth items that were set up very quickly in terms of treating COVID, uh, which were very much appreciated. Um, I guess the concern is if we are investing in telehealth, uh, why haven't the government uh, just instated these uh, MBS items as permanent rather than having a a clause that they expire at the end of December. Thank you, Michael. Minister, are you still there? Oh, yes, you are. Good. Great. Yeah, I I am here. Uh, Yeah, look, Michael, thanks for the question. Um, The MBS um, review has been simplified. Six out of seven of the... uh, It's been reviewed not just by the health department, but in conjunction with uh, peak groups like ACRAM and RACGP and AMA. Uh, uh, ACRAM, of course, very much involved in telehealth. Uh, And we will continue to review them. But currently, the the GP ones have been uh, simplified down to uh, less than six minutes and more than six minutes. 
um, but they've put in provisos that can uh, that uh, modify that in that if you're in a COVID hotspot, you get access to a lot of um, other things without the requirement of face-to-face. -face. The requirement of face-to-face -face in an existing relationship is the gold standard. And that's at least, you know, a, a proper face-to-face -face consultation with the uh, patient uh, at least once every 12 months. Because like we don't want to have health descend into um, seeing a doctor by, you know, calling a telehealth um, you know, call centre with just random hot, hot, uh, hot desk uh, medical practitioners. There's a place for that for emergencies after hours, uh, and there are exemptions like children um, who are and people who are homeless, uh, urgent after hours. Um, if you're a patient of uh, a known patient of uh, an Aboriginal community controlled health organisation, because you know a lot of Indigenous do a lot of um, returning to country and going across, can, you know, across the nation. Um, so that is there. There's also a item C for a long consultation in those hotspot areas. You know, mental health, reproductive health, uh, all those still um, remain for now, but it's a work in progress. We're not gonna, you know, destroy the massive, um, development of telehealth, we've just got to get it into a sustainable, simple uh, system. You know, for sexual health, uh, there's a lot of existing uh, and continuing numbers, but um, it will always be done um, with engagement with peak uh, body advice and engagement. Thank you, Minister. Um, Jill or Jen, would you have any, any, anything to add to those, that, that particular question, that particular issue? Can I say something? Yes, um, yes, yes. So thank you, Minister. And, and I think the exemptions that are in place are very good. But as I mentioned, it'd be really good if there were other exemptions for our doctor colleagues who are in rural and remote areas who can't access medical care and have also have complex issues um, that they are unable to, to deal with in their local community and can't, haven't seen somebody face to face. I actually go to as many rural areas as I can in South Australia to get around this exemption. Um, and, but having funding for that is difficult as well to try and get around the medical, yeah. Medicare exemption rule. Um, similarly, I was talking to somebody in a very remote area recently and they had, um, there was a big storm and there, um, I could only do it by telephone, um, you know, there isn't the proviso for a big storm. Um, so, so I, it'd be really good if there were, if there was the ability to get those exemptions. And I think it's fantastic that the Aboriginal one is continuing. And I would hope that that would continue past December as well. But again, these are complex things. These are not just repeat prescriptions. These are seriously difficult things that don't take six minutes. Yeah, okay. Point taken. Thanks, Jill. And, and just to add, Kim, as well, I know that were, there were provisions around, um, you know, any consultations over 20 minutes um, requiring video. And I think that really goes to what we're all talking about today yeah. in um, not only making sure that we've got the technology set up, but also the confidence from both a uh, healthcare provider, but also the patient's um, perspective. Um, and I know uh, the RACGP often call out that it really should be um, the patient's choice. Uh, as well and how they feel comfortable. So there's certain um, consultations that they would be more comfortable over video versus um, over the phone. Thanks, thanks, Jen. We, we've had a, a lot of questions about the, the balance between uh, uh, the awareness on, on both ends of the, of, of the call uh, around the needs, needs for digital literacy. Um, Angela teased Ali there because you had an interesting question about the uh, what might need to happen in order to enable that sort of uh, digital literacy in our in our remote communities and whether there are any sort of interesting innovations and, and experiments happening in that space. Would you like to ask that question? Uh, yes, it was really directed um, at the panel around uh, one of the key findings of our program has been that there is a challenge to digital literacy and the delivery of digital literacy. 
um, as well as the access to the technology. And we speak of that from a point of our program is associated with um, the delivery of the NDIS um, and aged care sector and DVA. Um, and of what we know, um, there is the opportunity to extend from a health centric focus to encompassing aged care and disability uh, care through telehealth. Um, and we, we would like to advocate strongly for there to be a response from the government around uh, implementing strategies to um, build the digital literacy of remote communities and very remote communities. And that encompasses um, health, disability, aged care, the carers themselves, um, and also the service providers as well. So there's going to need to be a considerable investment in uh, in developing that component of the sector. Yes, thanks, Angela. Good question. Uh, any comments from anyone, Jill or Jen or, or Minister, on that one? Yeah, Kim, from my yeah. perspective, I'm, I'm hearing some great examples um, and, I, and I mentioned around the local digital health champions. Um, so I think it's it's a really great, um, really great call out, Angela. And I think when you have trusted people in the community that are able to um, share their experiences and be able to work with the community um, on their digital needs, um, that's a critical part to sort of building, building that trust. Um, but also uh, what we've seen is, you know, in, in the Gawa example that I was talking to, um, they're, they're looking at uh, sort of upskilling the local community around technology so they can help support. So you can actually help create jobs um, in the community. And we've seen some great examples in Queensland um, also of that. Thank you. I think some of what limits us at the moment is that nine to five perspective that people take around mm -hmm. how um, services are delivered. I think there are far more services to be delivered outside of those the scope of those hours. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think that we're looking at, at how we can use time effectively uh, to deliver services. Thank you. Yeah. Minister, yeah. Yeah, look, I just thought I might add because I know people have um, asked not direct questions about this, um, but uh, one of the constitu not constituents, um, conference attendees asked about the digital health um, and my health record. Mm, mm. Thought I'd let you know two days ago, um, the digital health agency announced uh, as part of our forming up the next five year strategy for digital health, that there's an online survey about things that people would like to um, see in their digital health. And there's currently, the, unless it's, uh, I've misread the release, there's now 25 million people who can access their COVID results, their scripts, their allergies and diagnostic tests on their My Health record. There's also um, a couple of the PHNs, one in particular in Sydney that is trying to um, not synchronise, but uh, share more data in this digital space with the other silo of information, and which is the public hospital medical record system, which would be great because a lot, at least when I was still practising, um, the closest thing to a digital uh, thing was a, uh, a fax copy of the um, discharge sent to the GP. Whereas now you've got electronic medical records that can sync with the hospital. Um, you can give access to the hospital to get your um, digital health record from my health record. Uh, and the other thing that's new is um, electronic scripts yeah. and enabling apps so that you can take your scripts with you if you're away somewhere and take it to a, a you're not your regular pharmacy. Mm. Uh, I think they're called ISLs. Um, scripts. Yeah, and so uh, there's a lot that has happened and it will continue to evolve. Uh, we're, we're not giving up on it just because COVID's over. Yeah, thank you. Jill, any comments from you? I was going to comment about what Angela said, if that's all right. Yes, please, about digital um, literacy. Um, uh, the community connectors, I think, are supposed to, not supposed to be the digital connectors, but I think... Um, to, to upskill the community connectors um, who are part of um, the NDIS, certainly in the community I work in, um, 
so they're an essential part of it. But part of that is, is to, I think, to build up that ability for the, the clients um, to have that multidisciplinary team access mm -hmm. by telehealth. And I, I presume that part of the, uh, the upskilling of the community connectors is to um, give them that digital upskilling as well. Um, because I agree, it's it's impossible for the clients to have that. I, I don't think this is a matter of educating people or giving them access. I just don't think it's possible for a lot of the people who are on NDIS to be able to do that. There needs to be somebody to help them. Yeah. So we need to resource that and resource the skilling up of both those patients or, or clients and their advocates too. I think you're quite right. Um, mm -hmm. We, look, we, we're almost out of time, everybody. Uh, I, there was another question I, I was hoping to, to get asked um, about uh, the balance between face-to-face -face and, and digital services, but we're going to have to leave that, I think, because it's already 12 o'clock. Um, so, look, thanks again, everybody, for, for participating. I hope you've got something out of the discussion. That The, 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 the chat and, and the questions have been of very high quality. And I can see from the activity in the Q&A that some of the questions have already been answered. People are making links and sharing resources. So thanks very much for that. Uh, I'd like very much to thank all our, our presenters again. Thank you, Minister, for giving us so much time this morning. Uh, thank you, Jill. Thank you, Jen. I hope you've enjoyed the experience. It's certainly been a very energetic one for us. We will be making a recording of this webinar available on the Regions Rising website, which is regionsrising.regionalaustralia.org.au. Uh, please keep the conversations going on social media amongst the participants. If you haven't already, do sign up to the Regional Australia Institute's newsletter. You'll get more information on our webinars and our in-person events as well, and on the research and policy work that we're doing uh, through the in, in coming months. Thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Kim. Well run. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, everyone.